Well, I am flattered by this turnout. I understand that it's a, a little, little more than sometimes, and I'm thrilled. I'm Lynn Fenwick, and this is my husband, Larry. I think uh, I certainly know some of you, and for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Ralph and Pauline Beck's daughter. Uh, so maybe you knew my parents. They, uh, Daddy's been gone for a long time, and my mother's been gone for a while. And I am delighted to tell you about keeping a journal. And I've been eavesdropping a little bit. And I know some of you uh, have, have done that before, and some of you haven't. And I'm going to give you lots of ideas and options. I found this quote, and I thought it was a really good quote. People who keep journals <laughs> have life twice. Um, and uh, what I I wanted to share with you with these photographs. There are female journal keepers, there are male journal keepers, there are young hands and older hands that may be keeping journals. Um, I, wanted, I brought a lot of things to show you. Um, I don't know how many of you had one of these ladies when you were growing up with a lock, which anybody with a paper clip could have picked, uh, but I had two. Uh, I left them at home and after, after I was married and came back to the farm, my mother would talk about things that happened when I was in high school that I had no memory of. And then after mother was gone, I picked up my diary. I think mother read my diary more than I did, if, if I'm really honest about this. Probably the best known diarist in the world is Anne Frank. And I, uh, I want to tell you what she said about keeping a diary. It will break your heart. And if you think that you don't have time or anything relevant to write about, I want you to think about Anne Frank locked in an attic they slept during the day because they didn't want to be heard walking around in that attic. Um, and then at night is when they ate and when they came out and whispered a little bit. Um, her environment was limited and the alternative was terrifying and the most terrifying turned out to happen as you all I'm sure know her story. And this is what she said about writing in her journal. I can shake off everything as I write. My sorrows disappear. My courage is reborn. So if you think you don't have anything to write about or you don't have time to write about it or you just aren't motivated to write about it, remember what it did for that young girl. Um, I was asked to talk to you a little bit about Isaac Werner's journal. And I love to talk about Isaac Werner. Um, I was back in Kansas because mother had passed away and I was the executor of her estate. And we still had a home in Texas and the farmhouse, the Beck farmhouse, if those of you who drive around down in the south part of the county, uh, that's where we have returned to after living away for many years. Um, Larry was coming and going back to Texas and I stayed um, and I, I obviously wasn't busy all the time with mother's business, and so I thought, well, this will be a really good time uh, to do some genealogy research. And I had heard about this journal that a homesteader kept, and it, it, was, um, in the, it was mentioned in that history book for Stafford County, if some of you have that book. And it, it mentioned that I had some ancestors that were named in there. So I thought, I hope I can find that, but um, nobody seemed to know what had happened to it. Lucille had died, nobody knew. I was asking everybody, and finally I asked somebody on the board, and they said, Lucille gave us so many, many boxes of things that we haven't even gone through all of them yet. But you are welcome to come and uh, see if it might be somewhere down in the basement in one of those boxes. Now, I'd love to tell this story on somebody who's here today, but I won't name her name. She can raise her hand if she'd like to. 
But I spent the day, I had my cute little note cards, and I was ready to write down things about my family, but I felt guilty because I knew that probably I was the only one who would recognize a lot of the people in the pictures. And so if I opened a box and there was something in there that I felt like I needed to make a note, who the picture was of or what, whatever that um, related to my family, um, I felt like I needed to do that. And I had worked, I was in this small closet room and I had worked my way all the way around until the last part of the shelf. And I was just about to open it. I don't know whether I had pulled the tape off or I was just getting ready to. And they said, we're all leaving now and let us tell you which switch switches that you would touch, which switches you mustn't touch, <laughs> and how to make sure the door is locked. And I, I said, I, I think I'll leave. I think I'll just leave with the rest of you. And I did. The next morning, I get this phone call. The person is so excited that I don't know what has just been said to me, nor by whom. Um, and maybe she won't raise her hand. But anyway, she said, uh, we're going to be working there, and you can come back into town. And we'd had a terrible rain in the night. I don't really like to drive on the sandy roads after a heavy rain, but I wasn't about to stay home and miss out on seeing this journal. I brought my little note cards. They were nice. They had set out note cards and something for me to write with. And I read about a page before I knew immediately that this journal was a lot more than something for me to use about my own family's history. I use this picture because I want you to get a sense of the size of the journal. It's wider than the chair, and you can see how thick it is. It's 480 pages. You can kind of get a sense of his penmanship. Um, he wrote very densely. He writes nicely, but um, he wrote very close together, practically from binder to page edge. He saved some of the edge on the page because he used that almost like an index. Uh, but it is exactly the way a journal should be kept. And I want to read to you where he got his idea about how to keep a journal. And it's the best advice that I could give to you and I will elaborate on today. Um, but um, his first journal was kept when he was a young druggist in Rossville, Illinois. But uh, he wrote that more like a diary. He talked about himself. Uh, cute, cute young ladies that came into his drugstore. Um, what he was working on, what he agreed with, what he disagreed with. He, he wrote it uh, very personally and I'm so glad he did because that allowed me to get to know him more. Uh, but then he, <clears throat> excuse me, then he changed his uh, writing style. Go on. The reason that he changed his writing style was because he found an article by Reverend Beecher. Reverend Beecher was a minister in New York City. He is, was the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. He was very famous. He wasn't a television preacher, but somehow people all across America had heard of Reverend Beecher. And he did write articles in the paper that were not uh, biblical. And in this particular case, he was using um, the opportunity to talk about keeping a journal. A journal is that this, he started out by quoting his father. And this is his father's perspective. A journal is the devil's pillory, and fools sit in it. Everybody sins, but they need not sprawl out on paper an account of it. If you write the truth, you ought to be ashamed. And if you don't, you ought to be still more ashamed. Then, perhaps thinking this might be casting reflections on some of his own family, the father went on to say, Perhaps some folks might be profited by it. Everybody is not alike. But he didn't want, when he was dead and gone, to have folks fumbling over his private feelings, and he didn't mean to give them a chance. 
that was the last of his father's journal. Um, but now Reverend Beecher goes on and gives his opinion. But there is quite another sort of journal. One may trace from day to day the main facts of personal history, the proceedings of the farm, or the books read, visits made or received, the events in society, the conversations with men of mark, the facts of the weather, the seasons, the aspect of nature, and in short, a journal for knowledge in distinction from feeling, might be kept with great profit. It will be likely to cultivate a habit of accurate observation or reading. One who attempts to write down what he knows soon finds whether he really knows it or not. It will be useful also in forming the habit of expressing one's opinions with facility and felicity. But in all cases, a journal, if kept at all, should be kept with carefulness. Um, what I'm going to show you next are um, examples from, from Isaac's journal. Uh, Isaac did most of the things that I just listed to you from Reverend uh, Beecher's advice. The very first thing he did every morning was write down the weather. Now understand these people are farming uh, in a region where there were not farmers for a long time. And although he wasn't among the very first to arrive, um, they were all kind of finding their way of what sort of crops would grow best, when to expect the first frost, uh, all kinds of things like that. And he never failed to write down the weather every single morning. Uh, but he wrote about many of the other things, and we'll talk about some of those later. But I picked out two different things to read to you. Um, this was a St. John building. I believe it was. Uh, perhaps located where the, uh, the bank is now located. Uh, but there are buildings in St. John that resemble it even to this day. Uh, the uh, proprietor of that building uh, was F.R. Gilmore. I think he is the owner of that beautiful, I think it's a green home mm -hmm. in the western part of St. John. Um, and uh, Isaac had borrowed a little bit of money. He was not a borrower in the beginning. But he had borrowed a little bit of money from another uh, merchant, and that merchant had decided to close down that business, and he became a cattleman. And he handed over to uh, Gilmore the accounts that had not been settled up at the time that he left. And so Isaac uh, then relied on Gilmore when he needed to do that sort of transaction. So I'll read about that one first. The next one, I, when I read about it, this is obviously not a picture from Isaac's era, but it does illustrate what I'm going to be reading to you about. Um, this is from Isaac's journal in 1890. Despite the fact, oops, oh, it, this, is, uh, this one is the one I want to read first, and it's from 1886. Having gone into debt to buy Dolly, that's his uh, horse, Isaac was trying to think positively about his farm with a horse to open more land and assist with things he had been doing by hand. Yet he could not help but worry, as his September 20 journal entry states. Under somewhat discouraging financial prospects, $13 in pocket and $17 interest to start off. Doubtful about chance to borrow in town without something to mortgage. Gelman accommodating me with $7, what I needed, and refusing my note or interest. Bought New York draft in First National Bank for $17.65 in favor of Warren and Harrison, Emporia, Kansas, mailed same. All goods I wanted Offered at each store whenever I, whatever I wanted, money or no money. 
discovering I had better credit than I expected or asked. And then I add at the end of that in the, in the book, for a man who had shunned debt for so long, his pride about merchants' willingness to extend him credit seemed an ominous reversal. And like most of the people around here, debt did become a terrible issue. What happened was they came to Kansas in many cases and they talked with the people who had come ahead of them. And there weren't so many, and therefore there weren't so many farms, there weren't so many crops then when it was time to sell. They asked the original people, well, what did you get paid? How, how did you do? And they figured out, okay, I can do that. I can pay off this note in a year, maybe two. Well, what happens when there are more farmers and more fields? And that's what happened to them. And what happens when people start failing on their notes and the others are trying to renew their notes? Opposite direction. Interest rates went up as crop prices went down. And that was why a lot of uh, people gave up, didn't, didn't uh, finish out their, their claim, um, and struggled. The next picture is about horse racing. Um, I felt comfortable sharing this because it includes my relatives. So please don't take offense. Um, my, my relatives are one of the people that, that uh, um, get um, criticized in here. Despite the financial difficulties stalking nearly everyone in the community, gambling could still be found. On August 23rd in St. John, a much needed shower flooded the streets soaking everyone, including attendees at a horse race. Isaac's opinions were expressed in his journal at length, and this is a quote from his journal. Horse racing and original package system getting disgusting. That refers to if you buy the original package of something that was shipped in, like druggists could sell alcohol. Um, the majority of attendees got a good soaking but could not soak near all the whiskey out of some. <laughs> ben Weber, the Wilsons, and Ed Landis, the leaders, in some trickery and dissatisfaction, quarreling and knifing as usual. The thought makes one feel like such doing should be strictly prohibited by law. If some of those wretched could be served with photographs taken while in their stupid condition, some time afterwards, they might get ashamed to repeat such conduct afterwards. So those are two examples of how Isaac used his journal. Um, many of his examples aren't quite so interesting, but I thought you might enjoy those two. What is the difference between a diary and a journal? Some would say nothing. When I went in search for a specific definition to distinguish between the two, the definitions often contradicted one another. So don't worry about that too much. If, uh, if you are just getting started or you have been writing what you thought was a journal and now you think, oh dear, maybe it's a diary or the other way around, don't worry about it. Um, to the extent that the people I consulted online are experts, they don't even know the answer. But in general, a diary is dated, kept regularly, and not meant for others to read. My parents, uh, I guess in a, in a sort of sense of way, um, the uh, grain elevator, I don't know from which grain elevator, every year gave a calendar. And there was space at the bottom to write down appointments. And that hung on the wall at the Beck Farm as long as they, it was there after Larry and I were married and we'd come home and it was still on the wall. I think it was on the wall after Daddy died. Every year they put up a new one. And it, it is a history of how they, uh, the things that they attended and the things that they did. So in a way, that was sort of a very abbreviated diary. Uh, in general, a journal is a record of experiences and studies and is more reflective. Um, I want this talk to be encouraging. Isaac Werner wrote in his journal every day. It became a habit with him. 
he didn't write it for other people to see. Now, we're going to talk about the fact that sometimes you may choose to keep your journal because you want others to read it. But you may just decide you want to keep it for yourself. And although Isaac never expected anybody to read his journal, he faithfully kept it every day. That choice is up to you. But I wanted to encourage you, whichever way you choose to do it, and I found these two quotes I thought you would enjoy. I don't know whether you remember the author, Louis Lemoor. Uh, he said, start writing, no matter what. The water does not flow until the faucet is turned on. I love and um, I don't know whether you all know Martina Natrotolova. She's a tennis player. Uh, keeping a journal of what's going on in your life is a good way to help you distill what's important and what's not. And I thought that was great. Um, so those, those are some advice from others. I will remind you that Reverend Beecher suggested that keeping a journal could, quote, cultivate a habit of accurate observation. And I think that that's definitely true if you know you're going to go home and write it down or even while you're writing it down. Something that was in the back of your mind that you might have forgotten, if you're writing it out, you'll go, oh, 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 I don't want to leave that out. Um, it, it's good advice. Uh, I have several examples that I brought to share with you today. Uh, the first one I have listed up there is a travel diary, and I have three examples, including a blank one. <laughs> uh, these other two, Larry and I, uh, when Larry retired, um, and we, we were spending time coming and going, uh, looking out for our mothers, but we also um, used, uh, bought a motorhome, and we traveled a lot. Uh, and uh, I filled one book, looks like this one maybe is the one that's full, and um, I bought another one and filled it. And I don't know whether any of you have travel journals or not, but as you can tell, um, they're easy to find and they have a cover that um, makes it clear that's what they're intended to be used for. This is something that I thought you might not have thought about. And uh, Larry's mother gave me this. And it is a family heirloom cookbook, and it has uh, places for you to write the recipe. And then, uh, if you want to, and I did on some recipes and didn't on all of them. This page that I've turned open doesn't have it. But um, you could write a little narrative about it. And um, I got this out looking for a Christmas cake recipe. And I found another Christmas cake recipe. And um, it said, we love this recipe, and I fix it every year for Christmas. I hadn't fixed it for years. <laughs> and so about two or three years ago, when I reminded myself, oh, that's a tradition. I started uh, fixing that cake again. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're of a certain age and getting a little forgetful, uh, maybe this will help you remember from one year to the next that you have a tradition. Uh, book reviews. I didn't, I didn't bring anything about book reviews, but uh, at the turn of the century, I decided that I was going to get serious about reading the best books. And so I made a great long list of, um, and I consulted many sources on the internet, and um, I, I, it was going to be fiction, novels. And I picked out 100 books. Well, what happens with me when I read a book, as my, my husband can tell you, if I like the author, I, I buy other books by that author. Uh, if it's... Um, not a history book, but it's, got, it's based in a historic period. I want to learn about that actual uh, historic period, and so I buy books about that era. 
And um, I don't know how many books that I have read, and I'm not sure that I have read the first hundred, but I do know that I have five big ringed uh, binders where I do my little review when I read every book. And I find that I enjoy reading more because I know that I'm going to write a review. I pay attention to myself. I don't just let my eyes skim down a page. And um, um, so I recommend that as something that if you're having trouble deciding what you might enjoy um, developing a habit about, I certainly enjoy that. Um, keepsake journals to write for your descendants. Um, I didn't bring anything that has to be particularly uh, something that I have done, but I do have several keepsake journals that I brought. Uh, this one I gave my mother, and mother liked to write. She wrote for the newspaper, and she did write in it. Uh, it's, she even, I noticed, <laughs> painted a, pasted a picture of herself in it. Uh, so mother, mother did uh, keep the journal that I gave her. I'm not going to tell you who this journal is for, uh, but it, it provides me with the opportunity to uh, suggest that uh, Reverend Beecher was right. Uh, don't use a journal to be ugly about people. You see these torn out pages? Mm -hmm. I didn't tear them out for a long time because when I gave, when I give people these keepsake journals, I tell them, write in it whatever you want. I don't, I'm not asking you questions. Write whatever you want. This, this person wanted to write the ugliest things that could be said about people that she apparently wanted to vent about. And uh, I just did not want that going down into uh, another generation's hands, mine or anybody who found it after I'm gone, and I tore the page itself. This one is blank. Um, I have more uh, at home, but you can buy these uh, pretty blank books. You can see them at all kinds of prices. Some of them are not hardcover. Uh, it's a good way to get started. It's a great way if uh, if you think it would uh, discipline you better if you had something pretty to write in. Uh, but I, I think it's also sometimes a good idea if you have a uh, three ring book because maybe you'll write it and then you'll decide, I would like to polish that. I think that's worth polishing up and, and rewriting it or adding something I forgot. And uh, maybe you want to move around the sequence when you're finally putting it all together. Maybe you, your memory didn't necessarily write for you in direct chronological sentence, and if you uh, put it in a, a bound book, you're not going to be able to rearrange it the way that you could with a, a rain notebook. Um, this is one of, one of my favorites. I gave this to Mother. And... Um, it is illustrated, I collect children's books, and it is illustrated by one of my favorite children's book editors, and it's really a pretty book. And it has these little prompts, um, and then spaces to fill in with the little stories. Uh, mother, mother told a story in there about when she was young, too young to really be dating. One of the boys in the country who came into school uh, where she was going to school, um, thought she was pretty cute, I guess, and he gave her a ring. And uh, mother liked the ring, but his mother didn't <coughs> like the fact that he had taken some of the milk money to buy mother's <laughs> ring. And when she found out that mother had this ring, that had been bought with their milk money, she came and she said, I want that ring back. And so mother, I don't know how long she got to wear a ring. I'd never heard that story. 
and she told it. After Mother died, I uh, found this book, and um, I found that my brother had also given her a book. And good for her, his wasn't nearly as pretty as mine, <laughs> but it was a book with prompts. And so I uh, printed so that it was clear when it was my penmanship and when it was Mother's penmanship. Mother's is prettier than mine. Uh, she had beautiful script. And uh, I printed what she had written on that topic uh, for my brother's book. So I have a, a dual example of a prompting book. This is another example, and it was specifically mentioned to encourage the idea of keeping a journal for your family history. Um, this one uh, was never filled out. It was Irene's. It was a gift to her, and I had filled one out for her it, that's this same kind of a book. And it is a wonderful book if you are having trouble figuring out what to write. It has the traditional spaces for family names and birth dates, death dates, marriage dates. Um, but then at the back, it also has other kinds of blank pages, citizenship records. On my page, I have a picture that is in Isaac Werner's uh, book, Pray Bachelor, of uh, my family um, that uh, came over from England. Um, companies you have worked for, um, military service records. So it has all kinds of prompts. I'm, I, I don't know whether you could still buy this one or not, but you could buy others like it. So these are some examples. You could trace your personal history. You can trace your family history. You can describe social events, including family weddings, graduations, reunions, achievements. You could share conversations or wisdom from others, including family. Um, when Frida Hellwig, that, um, in Maxville, I don't know whether any of you knew Frida, uh, she had a 100th birthday party, and her kids gave it to her. And um, she was beloved. She had taught school. She had taught piano lessons. She was very, very active in the church. So many people came to talk with her, and at 100, she was amazingly clear-minded. She died at 103, and I'm so glad we had the chance to visit with her, and she had the chance to have the fun, because even the wisest, most alert mind can just disappear on you. And uh, she wasn't as clear-minded after that, but she made 103, and I'm so glad that I sat down and had a nice conversation with her. Larry talked with her. She... People may not know, Aunt Frida was my aunt. Oh. Yeah, that's the connection between Frida Helwig and me. She married my mother's brother, Philip Helwig, who passed away in 1978. He was the postmaster in Maxville for years. I thought you would uh, tell about what you talked with her about, the airplane landing. Oh, uh, Frida and her family lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and they lived there during the time that, uh, now I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Who flew the plane, the spirit of St. Louis to Lindbergh. Paris? Lindbergh. <laughs> they, lived, they lived in Atlanta during that time. And she was 10 years old, and when he came back to the States, Atlanta threw a parade through downtown Atlanta. And Frieda remembered so much detail about Lindbergh and that parade in Atlanta. And how many people living today could tell that story? And it was, it, yeah, it just blew me away. That, and I had never, again, I never knew about that connection. And she had other stories, when you live to be 103, she had other stories that I, you know, would only read about in history books that she experienced in her lifetime. So anyway, that's what Lynn was referencing. And we did not give her a blank journal to write in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but 
that's, um, if you'll go to the next, um, that's the last thing that I, I want to close with. And if you have some questions, I'll be glad to answer your questions. And if you want uh, to ask me some questions about Frey Batchelor and Isaac Werner, I'll be glad to share those with you too. Uh, remember, even the ordinary may be worth recording. And what I'm going to share with you is the fact that you will be grateful you did because you might forget the guy's name. <laughs> <laughs> or you might forget. Uh, I, I block names. I can remember things and I block names, something fierce. So when he turned around and looked at me, it was like, you're asking me? <laughs> uh, but uh, some of you may follow my blog. It uh, doesn't cost any money, and don't be fearful, it's never been hacked. But if you do go online, I know a lot of people, if they've never uh, clicked on something like that, they may be a little bit nervous about it. But uh, for over, well, basically for a decade, I have um, posted a blog every week, and I've only duplicated one time. Uh, so that's uh, something like 560 plus blogs that I have written. And I write about simple things. When you write a book, um, you have to do a lot of research that never shows up in the book. Not because you were looking for something that wasn't relevant, but because you were looking for something so that you wouldn't make a mistake. If I mention a bird in Prairie Bachelor, I have researched, either he mentioned it in his journal, or I did the research to know that that particular kind of bird was there. Um, I don't think there were deer in Kansas. Uh, there are certainly deer in Kansas now, and if you weren't careful, if you were just oblivious, and you wrote a book about uh, the 1800s and you had a deer in it, you, you didn't do your homework. So I had a lot of things that I found that were interesting, but they aren't in the book, but they are in the sense that they saved me from making a mistake. Um, and that's what, in the beginning particularly, that's what I wrote about. Uh, but I wrote about, I have written about a great many things. People seem to enjoy the history the most. Um, I did a series of what was your favorite childhood book. And uh, then it, I think I, uh, carried that forward for about four weeks because people shared what their favorite books were. And they were, most of the people who responded were my age or older. And that was really fun to see what they were reading at that time. Um, so any one of those blogs, if you want uh, to think, well, I don't know what to write about, you might take a glance at um, my blog and see the wide range of things that actually would have made an interesting thing for you to write about um, in some similar vein. Um, what you use to put your journal in is not important. If you think it'll make you uh, stick with it better and you have a pretty book to write in, then that's wonderful. It may be a way to discipline yourself to continue the project. Um, but as I said, it doesn't have to be anything. The first picture that I took of the, uh, on the right side, the man was just writing on a piece of paper. Um, if, uh, I've done a lot of genealogy, and a lot of my ancestors, um, I wish they would have written on something, but they wrote something interesting down, and my mother-in-law especially was a sweetheart about saving that sort of thing. So um, I'm glad that it was saved. But probably having some kind of a book is a good idea instead of just a stack of papers. Uh, I chose this particular uh, image. It's one of my favorite portraits. When we lived in Atlanta particularly, I, had, I started out college as an art major. I lasted one semester. Larry and I were married. We both worked 30 hours a week. We, uh, I know... I was paid 90 cents an hour, um, and when you add all that up for groceries and <laughs> whatever, um, we didn't have a lot of money, and I've, I discovered it took quite a bit of money to buy all the supplies that you needed for art classes. 
The other thing I didn't have a lot of was time because we both carried full loads and um, so I was an art major for one whole semester and then I moved on to other things. Um, every time we moved to a different city I found their art society and sometimes more than one and I would go to those meetings and there would be demonstrations. We lived in big cities and a lot of times there were enough of our members that we could afford to bring well-known illustrators <clears throat> and artists and I got to watch them do their drawings. The biggest, I learned a lot of lessons. Um, if you're drawing a picture of an older person, their hair isn't shiny. Children's hair is shiny. Older people's hair, if you make it look shiny, it's not right. People look at the picture and they don't quite know why. I just thought of that. I learned that from a man who was doing, an, um, a, I think he was using, uh, I don't remember, colored pencil or whatever he was using. And he said, no, I can't, make, I can't make the model's hair too shiny here because she's an older person. That never had really registered with me before. Those kinds of things I was uh, the benefit of because I participated in those classes. And, uh, all of you are participating in a class and that's wonderful because when we keep getting out and we keep learning, you never know what you're going to learn about when you show up for one of those meetings. Um, but um, I became very active, and especially when we moved to Atlanta, and I am very proud to say that I was, um, you had to have so many of your pieces of work uh, accepted for shows and I had enough of my work shown that I was uh, designated as a juried portrait artist. And um, these two little girls, I just love them. And the reason I'm telling you this now is to make you be encouraged to write now about things that you might not think were all that important at the time because you already know it. You've got it in your mind. Um, I pulled this picture out about a week or ten days or so ago, and I said, now, I, I know where I was, the children were at the zoo, if you can get, if you do portraits of children, if you can get them interested in something else, uh, so they're not paying attention to you, you can do a much better picture of them, because children love to pose, and usually their poses are so artificial and corny, and not not worth drawing. Um, so um, their mother and I had taken the two girls to the zoo and um, I took rolls of film at that time. No camera phones when that was done. And they weren't paying any attention to me and at this point I don't remember whether that was a, um, a number of pictures that I um, then created around and, and drew what I drew. But Larry and I both agreed they were in Houston. We both agreed that I was there, but <laughs> we, we started disagreeing about why I was there, when I was there, uh, who was with us when we went to the zoo, uh, and I don't know. Of course, I think I'm right, but he thinks he's right. And if I would have had the discipline every time I did one of these portraits, um, uh, I don't have the portraits anymore. This is a photograph. When I, did it, when I finished a portrait, I would take a picture of it, but that's all that I have. Um, if I would have just written a story about that. For a long time, we, we remembered. We both remembered the same thing, uh, but, but now we don't. Uh, and so uh, one motivation that you might think about to encourage you to write, and I've tried to give you lots of ideas about things to write about, and certainly writing about your family, um, and, and I think that was uh, what you wanted me to, to emphasize, the importance of sharing family information and genealogy. Um, that's important, but write about other things too. Uh, maybe your kids will throw it in the trash. 
Maybe they'll read it and say, why did, why did she keep this? But maybe they'll pick it up like I pick up some of these things and I'm excited that they were saved. Um, and I hope, I hope you all um, have been inspired just a little bit, even if it's just to go home and write down one single thing. Or maybe you'll start a journal and that would be wonderful. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask me. Yes. Is your blog the same thing as your column in the newspaper, or is it? Is it? Yeah. I have given permission to the newspaper. I, I want our small town newspapers to survive. I don't get paid any money for it. She decides, uh, she looks at my blogs and decides either which one she likes or which one she needs filler for the newspaper. I don't know which. I don't have anything to do with um, and she doesn't alter them. The one thing that I did ask is, please, she gives them a name. The name, the titles aren't necessarily mine. But she doesn't change anything. So sometimes if you're reading them and, and they'll say, as in the picture above, and there's no picture, uh, that's because she just publishes the blog the way that I've written it. And if you uh, go to the blog, there's a picture there <laughs> or two. Well, I would encourage everybody to do it also. I've been a journalist for a long time. After I got my family raised, I started journaling. <clears throat> but it, it has been particularly meaningful to my children and my grandchildren after Jim died because they want to read them. Even now, at their young age, they're wanting to read them. My uh, great-grandfather fought in the Civil War, and he did not write directly in a journal. Um, he wrote on whatever he could get his hands on. And sometimes it was a laundry ticket. But he mailed these things back and somebody wrote in, in a journal. And uh, it's, it's a very tired leather journal that's been opened and closed by lots of descendants, I think. Um, and I have that journal. And it's a treasure. It's just a treasure. And he did survive the Civil War. Um, he served for three years. I write a lot about Civil War soldiers in the state of Kansas. And I don't know how many of you know that if you were a Civil War soldier and you wanted to stake a claim, you got one year's credit toward your claim for every year that you served in the Union. If you served on the other side, you didn't get any free land. Uh, but if you served for the Union, and my grandfather served three years, so to prove up a claim, it took five years, which meant that after three years, he just had to have two years before he could uh, proceed with the applications to get the title. Uh, there's a great deal of Kansas history and a great deal of history about where, where we are. Um, this was the county seat. Isaac came to the county seat. He attended programs here. Um, the uh, formation of the just farm organization, not the national organizations, but the agricultural society that was formed here. Isaac is the one who initiated it. Um, I write in there about the people who came and, the, and who the leaders were. Um, there, was, uh, there is a lot of information about this community and about the people living in this community. I will share one more thing with you. Uh, if, you if there are more questions, I... Um, after finding the journal, Larry and I had a trip planned to New England, and it had nothing to do with Isaac Warner. Um, Larry and I are big fans of, the, of Willa Cather and um, the Willa Cather, um, if you haven't ever been to the Cather Museum in Nebraska, uh, I love Willa Cather. She writes about the prairie um, and uh, I, I hope that, uh, I, I like to praise Willa and hope that more people will read her. Uh, she was the first woman to ever get a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, she writes about the land. Uh, young people that I've recommended Cather to, um, there are no car chases. 
there are there are no <laughs> battles. Uh, she writes about the land, and um, O Pioneers is one of my favorite. I identify with the woman who is the main character and who um, runs the farm, and her father turned it over to her and told the two sons, let your sister take care of things because he, he believed in her. Um, but um, anyway, I don't even remember now where I was going to go with Willa. Uh, <laughs> but um, I recommend it very, very highly to you. And um, that's, that's one of the books that um, she was a good observer. And that's what uh, being a journal writer is about. Um, it, for some people, it moves more slowly because she talks about taking a nap in, on a sandy spot and hearing the ants and the rustling of the grasses. And um, young people don't always get real excited about ants and rustling grass, but um, I do. And, I don't know what I was going to tell you about Catherine, but you I, already I, told I, did anyone time. bring a journal that you, you wanted to share or tell us about before we bring it My grandmother <laughs> wrote diaries, and I have four of them, and each one of these had five years in it. But I like this especially because it's a writing about when my parents got married. So I feel blessed to have them. And I have everything marked if my kids want to look at it. <laughs> my mother did that too, and I have four of them in my Peter kids. That she wrote, you know, we're five years. If you're interested, a lot of people whose names you will recognize, I, I copied these for you to just glance at it if you're curious, uh, were journal keepers. Leonardo da Vinci, Thomas Edison, Frida Kahlo, um, Lewis and Clark, their journal keeping, um, Marie Curie, Mark Twain, Albert Einstein, Virginia Woolf, I don't know if any of you are Virginia Woolf novel <coughs> um, Lewis Carroll, and Samuel Peppers. So, uh, if you're curious and you uh, aren't ready to get out of here and head over to uh, your next commitment, um, then uh, you may want to glance at some of those. Okay. Thank you all. I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sign my book. <laughs>